Hello, hello, and welcome to our lecture on the integumentary system. So this is going to be the integumentary system of the human body. This is encompassing the hair, skin, glands, and nails. All right, so we're going to see the structures of the integument here. Integumentary system consists of the hair, skin, glands, and nails. It is going to be the largest organ. So the skin as a whole, the largest organ in the body. We see that it's going to comprise about 8% of our total body weight. Major functionality here for our uh, integumentary system. It's going to be protective, right? It's keeping the stuff that's inside of us, inside of us, and keeping the stuff that is in the outside environment away from getting into our bodies. It's going to maintain fluid balance. So it prevents fluid loss. It also prevents fluid gain. Regulates our metabolic processes. For secretion and absorption, we see things like secreting waste products like sweat, oils, earwax. It has immune functionality. It has immune dendritic cells, which are able to digest pathogens that land on the skin. Temperature regulation. Again, we can do things like sweat regulation, all right? Decreasing body temperature by sweat and sensory perception. Our nerve endings allow us to dictate things like pressure, touch, temperature, and everything in between. So our, for our protection mechanism, they're going to be protective in terms of injury, all right? So preventing extreme injury or trauma to our internal environment, having a barrier to toxins like chemicals, spores, bacteria, and other microbes like viruses, parasites, temperature regulation. So we maintain an internal temperature at a relatively constant rate, protecting the internal environment from the heat and the cold, and also protecting us from the sun. So the solar radiation that we get in the form of UVA and B rays is going to be blocked out by the skin. We use those ultraviolet radiations in order to synthesize things like vitamin D. For water loss, it's going to protect against dehydration. We notice that in the case of burns, our first uh, worry usually is going to be water loss. Because if we have burns that are severe, we take away that surface layer of protection. And therefore, we get a lot of water loss from the internal portions of the body through that opening in the skin surface. So burn victims, usually the consideration is get the fluids in, keep hydration status normal. For metabolic regulation, we have things like vitamin D that we synthesize through the skin due to ultraviolet radiation. One thing that's common in children or used to be common was vitamin D deficiency and that caused what is rickets or also known as bow-legged syndrome. Secretion and absorption, again, we secrete things like sweat, oil, earwax. We can absorb things through the skin. We've heard of transdermal patches, right? Transdermal medications. This is medication that is absorbed through the epidermal cells into the dermis of the skin. We have immune functionality. We have the epidermal dendritic cells that exist in the epidermal region. These are going to digest microbes as they try to enter into the skin. For temperature regulation, we have two things. We can either do vasodilation or vasoconstriction. For vasodilation, this is going to be enlargement of the blood vessels. So the smooth muscle of the blood vessels relaxes, allows for movement of blood to be closer to the surface of the body and release heat. If we want to conserve heat, we have vasoconstriction. This is where blood vessels contract, diminish blood flow to the exterior, and therefore we have more conservation of heat because less blood flow is going to the skin. So we have less heat loss through the skin. Sweating, we have sweat gland release. This is in order to cool the body. Once the internal environment of the body gets to a temperature that's above normal set point, sweating mechanism will kick in. We have sensory reception. 
There are massive amounts of free nerve endings in the skin. All of them have some sort of perception that they gauge from the external environment, whether that be temperature, changes, pressure, vibration, or pain. Um, any of these environmental stimuli have their own set of nerves that are innervated because of those sensations. So for the skin, we have three layers. The top layer is going to be the epidermis. The epidermis is not vascularized, so we do not have any blood flow here. The blood flow comes in on the dermal layer. Dermis is the layer underneath the epidermis. And finally, the subcutaneous layer, which is not technically part of the integument, but it is the basement substance or basement membrane of the integumentary system. So, we have these different tissue types that exist inside of the skin. We have the epithelial tissue, which comprises the epidermis. This is a keratinized squ uh, stratified squamous, meaning that it is cells filled with keratin protein that are squamous, so the flattened cells. And they're going to be in a stratified layer or component, meaning they are going to have multiple layers of flat squamous cells. The connective tissue underneath in the subcutaneous basement membrane area is going to be areolar. We have dense irregular connective tissue as well. We have smooth muscles that exist attached to things like sweat glands, hair follicles, and blood vessels. And we have the extensive nerve innervation for our different sensations. So the types of cells that we have present here in the epidermis, we're going to have keratinocytes and melanocytes. In the dermis, we're going to have tactile cells and sensation cells. And in the epidermis, we also have our dendritic cells for our immune functionality. So our keratinocytes exist throughout the entirety of the epidermis. They will start at the initial basement membrane layer, what is known as the stratum basale. They're going to begin here and they're going to continually produce a protein known as keratin for the remainder of their lifespan. Eventually, those keratinocytes die, and they are basically just lumps of keratin protein by the time they get to the top. Located throughout every cell layer of the epidermis, and they are replaced every 27 days. Tactile cells, one of nature is going to be a Merkel disc. This is going to be for touch, through touch and perception of pressure. We see a sensory neuron, sensory nerve ending attached to this Merkel disc. We have the epidermal dendritic cells. These are also known as Langerhorn cells. They're there to encounter microbes and pathogens on the cell, uh, cell surface and potentially digest and destroy them. Next, we have melanocytes. Melanocytes exist in the basement uh, membrane of the epidermis only. So they are in the stratum basale only. They produce melanin. Melanin is the pigmentation protein for the skin. They have a special organelle within them known as a melanosome. This is the area of protein synthesis for melanin. They transfer that melanin over by exon endocytosis to the keratinocytes. So our first portion of the epidermis. The epidermis exists from the basement membrane of the stratum basale, which forms the dermal ridges here, right? The epidermal ridges are going to be the separation between the dermis and the epidermis. So our first layer here is the epidermal ridges. There are five layers to the epidermis. The basement layer is the basale. There is a spiny layer known as the spinosum. There is a granular layer known as the granulosa. There is an uh, area that is located uh, mainly in very dense places, um, such as the palms of the hand and soles of the feet, known as the lucidum. And then the top layer, which is the layer of skin facing the outside, is the corneum. So we begin with the stratum basale. 
This is going to be the area that is going to form the epidermal ridges here. It is deepest of the epidermis, superficial to the dermis. It contains keratinocytes, melanocytes, and also tactile cells or touch cells. So we have a Merkel disc here. Keratinocytes are the progenitor cells. So they are the stem cells for all of the keratinocytes that exist all the way to the surface. The melanocytes are going to stay in the basement membrane of the stratum basale and produce our melanin protein. The tactile discs are going to be uh, touch sensation and they will exist every so often throughout this membrane. For this layer, the cells are living. They are stem cells. They are alive, which means that they are undergoing mitosis and cell division. There's a single layer of cuboidal shaped cells, cuboidal cells meaning cube shaped. It is attached to our basement membrane of connective tissue for the dermis. Another name for it is going to be the stratum germinativum or just simply the basal layer. Our next layer is the stratum spinosum. See the stratum spinosum looks like a spine almost. It's going to be an oblong area of shaped cells. We have keratinocytes, of course, again. And we also have a couple of immune cells that exist within this layer. We have a Langerhans cell sitting here. These cells are still living, but they are not going to be dividing. So they're going to be cells that are living, producing keratin protein, but they're not actively dividing. So there are several layers of oblong polygonal shaped cells. Again, another name for this is the spiny layer, stratospinosum. And it is the second deepest layer of the epidermis. Next is the stratum granulosum. This is an area of granulated cells. Right here, we see that it is a middle layer, pretty much. At this point, the keratin has begun to take, an, uh, take over the cell. So the keratin protein has populated itself to where it is pretty much choking the cell, and the cell is ready to die. So the cells are still technically alive, but they are undergoing keratinization, which is pretty much becoming a glob of keratin protein. They are not dividing, and they are simply filled with granules of protein. They are squamous shaped, so we see that they are flattened out now. So they are squamous epithelial cells. Another name for this is going to be the granular layer. It is our third deepest. Next is the stratum lucidum. Again, the stratum lucidum only exists with very thick skin. So we find it in the palms of the hand, soles of the feet. Is an area of clear flattened cells. These are keratinocytes, but now they have become keratinized, so they are no longer living. They are dead cells, and they are filled with a protein known as aledin. Aledin is a precursor protein that is not keratin, but it leads to keratin as it continues to age. So this is going to be the second deepest, or sorry, the second most superficial layer. But again, it is going to be present only in the palms of the hands and soles of the feet. And this is the area of the thickest skin. The top layer is going to be the stratum corneum. Here we have several layers, up to 20 or 30 layers, of very thin, flattened out, keratinized cells. So they are dead. They are not dividing. They are filled completely with keratin. They are scaly and interlocked, and they form the surface of our skin. Another name for the stratum corneum is going to be the horn-like layer. All right. So the dermis, the second layer of the skin. We have two specific areas. One is the papillary layer, which is where we have the dermal papilla, which are these protrusions that go up into the epidermal ridges. So we see this is almost like, looks like one of those sponge pads with the, the interlocking um, pointy things that you put on your bed, um, like a mattress pad almost. And they point up into the epidermal ridges. 
Second is the reticular layer. The reticular layer is where we have a lot of activity going on. So here we have a lot of blood flow innervation. We have nerve innervation. We have the roots of hair follicles. We have musculature existing. We have glands. We have sweat glands. We have sebaceous glands. We have a lot of different cellular processes going on in this reticular layer. So the papillary layer is going to be the superficial layer of the dermis. It's going to contain the dermal papilla, which are those extensions going up into the epidermal ridges. It's made up of areolar connected tissue, as I mentioned previously. So we are going to have blood flow, form of capillaries, and we are going to have nerve innervation with sensory nerve endings. The reticular layer is the deep layer of the dermis. It is attached to the papillary layer on its superficial side. On its deep side, it is attached to the subcutaneous layer of the basement membrane. It is made up of dense irregular connective tissue. So it is very much a ground substance. It is very distensible. It moves around easily and it is able uh, to change direction and malleate. Right? So it has lots of elastin and collagen fibers that allow for it to be able to move in different directions without compromising its structure. Here's where we find the bases of several different things, such as hair follicles, sebaceous glands, which secrete oil, sweat glands, and nerves and blood vessels. All right, underneath the dermis, we have the area of connective tissue, which is the subcutaneous layer. Here we have areolar and adipose tissue. We find that this area has a good blood supply. So if we want to give what is called subdermal medication. We do a subdermal injection into the sub-Q layer, right? That sub-Q layer is going to anchor the skin. It's going to serve as an energy reservoir. If we have a lot of fat content here, again, we can get nine calories per gram of energy from fat tissue. It is thermally insulating the inside and it also acts as padding. As a reminder, this is not actually part of the integumentary system. It is just the basement membrane with which the integument sits on top of. So we can also term this as the hypodermis, hypo underneath the dermis, or the superficial fascia, which is going to be covering the musculature underneath that. So here's our layers. Remember from the bottom, we have the subcutaneous. It's going to be deep to the dermis, composed of areolar and adipose connective tissue. We have the dermis, which has the reticular layer and the papillary layer. The reticular layer is the deep layer made of dense irregular connective tissue. It has hair follicles, sebaceous glands, sweat glands, nerve endings, blood vessels. Papillary layer is the superficial layer, composed of areolar connective tissue, forms the papilla. Five layers of the epidermis, we have the basale, which is going to be a single layer of cuboidal cells. It is going to be keratinocytes mainly. We have cell division occurring here, so we do have active mitosis. We also have populations of melanocytes producing melanin and tactile cells or Merkel discs. The stratum spinosum is going to be many layers of polygonal shaped cells. These are going to be keratinocytes that are still living. We also have epidermal dendritic cells here, what are known as Langerhans cells for immune functionality. Next, we have the last layer of living cells. So this is the stratum granulosum. Stratum granulosum is usually keratinocytes that have granules in the cytoplasm, and those are the beginnings of keratinization. Then in our thick skin with the palms and the soles of the feet, we have two to three layers of what is called anucleate cells in the stratum lucidum, meaning that they do not have any organelles. They are dead keratinocytes, and they produce the aledin protein. Finally, we have the stratum corneum. This is the top layer, most superficial layer of the dermis. It's usually squamous to pretty much flat cells that are dead, and they are keratinized completely, so they are filled with keratin protein. So for our skin color, we have several different things that dictate that. As far as perfusion goes, if we have a lot of blood flow to the surface of the skin, then we might have a red hue, and that is because of the red coloration of hemoglobin as it is bound to oxygen there. 
what dictates our normal pigment is melanin. So the amount of melanin that we produce is going to dictate whether we have lighter or darker skin. More melanin equals darker skin. We can increase melanin production by exposure to UV radiation. And also we have to think about our heredity and what our melanocyte population is going to be because of our heritage. Finally, we have keratin. Keratin, if we have um, a lot of, can produce a little bit of a yellowish or orange pigment to the skin. And that can come into play if we have a lot of orange vegetables, such as squashes, carrots, bell peppers, things like that. All right, so here we have a couple of variations, some different things that we see, all right. Top left, we have an albino, okay? So we have lack of pigmentation there. We have freckles in the middle, right? Freckles, little spots on the skin. Top right, we have a guy who's uh, undergoing cyanosis, which is blue, blue coloration of the skin. Here, it looks like we have psoriasis. Right there, we have a mole existing on the face. So a couple of epidermal derivatives. Things that are somewhat similar to the skin, but not exactly the skin. We have the hair, nails, and glands. So some specifics on this. Nails. We find them on the ends of fingers and ends of toes. They're there mainly as protection. So they're protecting your fingers from damage or protecting the ends of your fingers from damage. Also, to a lesser degree, if, if they are long enough, they can assist you in grasping objects. And we can look at them as far as an indicator of health. So if you look at the nails and you find that they are of good color, they are relatively, you know, purple, well perfused, pretty much consistent with their coloration, then that is usually an indicator that you are in okay health. For hair, we have three main types. Our first one is going to exist in uh, fetuses and a baby for a short period of time and is known as lanugo. Lanugo hair is going to start to grow during the third trimester, and it usually goes away after a couple of weeks after birth. Then we have vellus hair. Vellus is the little, what we would call wispy hairs, or someone referred to it as baby hairs, that are over the body. They're not very dark. They're not very thick. Usually they're more of a blonde or white coloration, and they are very fine. So we find those on face, arms, legs, etc. And finally, it's our terminal hair, which is our permanent hair. This is going to be the whole, uh, coarse long hair that you find on your head, uh, with your beard, um, if you have bodily hair, chest and stomach. Um, so this is going to be the permanent hair that you find in places of hair growth on your body. So the function of the hair. Function of the hair is twofold. One, protection. All right, we're going to protect certain areas from Things like sun, environmental toxins, debris. Um, if it's the eyelashes, we're protecting from substance going into the eye, getting something in your eye. And the second one is going to be for physical identification. So we use hair in order to indicate different things, like some things uh, of facial expression um, or being able to identify individuals, um, seeing someone different. Um, each one has their individual marker of what their hair looks like or what their appearance is based on that. Hair is also going to have a chemical property. We've heard of pheromones before. Hair is able to release pheromonal signals, especially under the case of heightened body temperature or during sweating. You see for facial expression here, see how it's it's a little bit more difficult to tell what someone's expression means if there are no eyebrows present. It gives us an indicator of age. So someone who has a grayer and whiter hair is going to be indicated as older. It also tells us a little bit about sexual orientation, usually, right? A lot of body hair is a male characteristic. All right, the glands. In the skin, we have what are called exocrine glands, meaning they secrete their product to the outside environment. 
We have exocrine glands in the form of sweat glands. There are two types, maracrine and apocrine. We have sebaceous glands, which secrete sebum, which is the oily compound that coats the surface of the skin. We have ceruminous glands, which secrete earwax in the ear auditory canal. And in females, we can have milk production from mammary glands. So here's a little fill-in chart you can use. And by the time we get through these glandular functions, we should be able to fill it in. So for a American sweat gland, these glands are going to be simple coiled tubular glands. They're going to be located in the dermal layer of the skin. So we find them in the reticular dermis. They're going to be very common. So they're going to be all over your body surface and they're going to secrete normal sweat. And the sweat that they secrete is 99% water. Main function here, of course, thermal regulation for the entirety of the body. The mechanism of secretion is by exocytosis. Apocrine glands are a little bit different. Their structure is similar. They are simple coiled tubular glands. They're going to be in the reticular dermis, but only in certain regions of the body. Those regions of the body are in the armpit or axillary region, around the nipples of the chest, and in the pubic and anal regions. There's a lot more substance that is within the sweat in these areas. There are going to be proteins and lipids that are present. It's going to have pheromonal concentrations, and it might have concentrations of bacteria as well. And that is why apocrine sweat glands are able to produce sweat that might cause body odor. They have a very large lumen in order to accommodate for these additional substances so they can pass through and out into the uh, surface of the body. And the mechanism of secretion is going to be exocytosis as well. Sebaceous glands, sebaceous glands are going to be secreting sebum or the body oil. Their structure is a simple branched acinar gland. So they're going to have several branches existing on the same structure. They form holocrine secretions, which means that the cells inside of them disintegrate. And once they disintegrate, they go through the lumen of the tube into the hair follicle and out. So they are associated directly with hair follicles. Keeps the hair in the skin moisturized with oil, and they have some bactericidal properties. Oil secretion is going to be stimulated in large part by hormones, right? We see sex hormones such as testosterone have a very large impact on that. That is why a secretion of oil is typically high during puberty and things of that nature. And we also have episodes of acne that are high during puberty because of the increased clogging of pores from oil secretion. In the ear, we have the ceruminous glands. They're going to be simple coiled tubular glands. They're going to secrete earwax, I want to known as cerumen. And cerumen is there to try and pick up and collect foreign particles that enter into the auditory canal and stop them from getting to the eardrum. The mammary glands, here we have complex glands. They're going to be compound acinar glands, so very large complex glands. They're going to be located in the breast near the areola and they produce the breast milk that allows feeding of infants for caring mothers. So here's our example of the excrement gland. Here we have a sebaceous gland or an oil gland attached to a hair follicle. The oil is going to be secreted out into the hair follicle space and will venture up through the shaft to the external environment, nourishing and moisturizing the hair and the skin. Here we have a American sweat gland and a normal sweat gland. We see that we have a coiled tubular shape. The duct for that sweat gland will travel all the way through up to a sweat pore located on the surface of the skin. Down here we have an apocrine sweat gland. So we can see that the apocrine sweat gland is going to be attached to the hair follicle and it's going to secrete its sweat into the hair follicle shaft and go out the same space. Skin is also protecting against injury. 
So the level of injury is going to be partly indicated by how deep or uh, how much we take away from the skin's protection. So if we get through the layers, we go from the epidermis to the dermis to the subcutaneous to the muscle. Now the repair is either going to be by two processes, right? If the injury is very superficial, we only impact the dermis or the epidermis. Usually we can heal that area by regeneration. Regeneration is where we have cells that are simply replaced over time as that old dead area gets sloughed off or leaves. And this usually means that we have full restoration of function and normal skin around that area. Fibrosis is when we have a little bit of a, uh, a deeper and more severe injury. This is where we have a cut, usually through the dermis, sometimes down to the subcutaneous layer. This is where we have to start forming scar tissue. If we interrupt the stratum basale of the epidermis and we destroy the keratinocyte stem cells that are there, that means that we have to produce something to fill the space because the keratinocytes are no longer there to produce new keratin cells. So we have to fill that area and what we do is use fibroblasts to secrete collagen and create scar tissue for that area. That means that the area is going to be filled with scar tissue and it will not look the same as it did before. If it is in an area where there is a strong amount of function or it needs to move or it needs to be pliable, this can cause impairment of that function. Our indicator for this is how much tissue is destroyed. So if we find that the dermis is destroyed, that means that the hair, the glands, the nerves, and everything in that area is also destroyed. We have our stages of wound healing. First, if we find that we have a blood vessel that's been cut into, it will bleed. And once it bleeds, we start to form a clot. Blood clots are going to form so that we can stop blood from leaving the vessel, while underneath, we can start to form uh, sort of a meshwork that's going to trap that area for the tissue to regrow. So we see that the clot is going to be a temporary barrier to keep pathogens out. And this is also going to stop blood from leaving the vessels. All right. So during that clot formation, we have white blood cells that are going to go into the area, find any pathogens that may have infiltrated the area of injury and hopefully destroy them. After the clot is formed and we start our white blood cell infiltration of the area, the blood vessel has to regrow and the tissue around it has to regenerate. So the blood vessels will regrow and the granulation of tissue will start to form. We have collagen that's being released. We have the vascular connective tissue there that's forming. Fibroblasts are going to lay our collagenous matrix and begin to form that connective tissue again. The epithelial layer, the area of the epidermis, will regenerate. And once that regeneration takes place, or the connective tissue forms the fibrosis or the scar, then the protective scab will no longer be needed and we can it'll fall off. So there we have a new area of healed up skin. So here are our stages. We have a cut or an initial injury. Here we have a wound into the epidermal space down into the dermis. There's a blood clot that is formed at the top of the wound. And during that time, we have infiltration of immune cells into the area of injury, attacking any foreign pathogens that might have made their way in during that injury. Next, we begin to have regrowth of the tissue underneath. So our blood vessels begin to regrow. The tissue begins to regrow. Finally, we see the epithelium regenerate. And once we have the epithelium regenerated, the area underneath will also be regenerated. So our fibroblasts have used collagen to form scar tissue underneath here in the dermis. And we have regenerated the epidermal area here. And we can see that we do have a scab left over from the blood clot, but again, it will come off 
and uh, will no longer be needed. <clears throat> so our final mention for the uh, integument is going to be how the skin runs. So usually the skin is going to run a certain way. It's going to move a certain direction more easily than it moves in a different direction. And these are known as lines of cleavage. Lines of cleavage are the natural propensity lines that the skin has to be able to move and mold. So for example, if we were to make an incision and we made an incision that was perpendicular, or we did it at a 90 degree angle to the line of cleavage of that particular area of the body. That means that this area may uh, be larger than it would be otherwise, and it will also take longer to heal because we are moving in the opposite direction that that line of cleavage is. So the skin is going to be malleable, left and right, but up and down in this area of the abdomen, it is not going to be as malleable. So that means it's going to take longer. But for our second example down here, if the incision is parallel to the cleavage line, especially on the posterior calf, if we have cut an anterior to posterior section, or we have gone top to bottom, we have followed the longitudinal lines that the line of cleavage has. So that incision is usually going to be a little bit smaller and it's going to heal more quickly because we are following the path that the skin normally moves and wants to move in a very set period. So if we look at this, all right, usually lines of cleavage are going to indicate where we can cut and it, uh, how we can cut and if it will heal faster or slower. Distensibility of skin is going to be dictated by two things age and ethnicity, right? So usually the older we get, the less distensible skin is. So younger skin is going to have less degrees of collagen. So we are going to see a schematic representation here. Histology of the skin, we have a microscopic section here. So the collagen density is high. That means we have a lot of distensibility in the skin. It can move around. All right, it's very pliable. And those collagen fibers are going to run in directional bundles. And with those directional bundles, we are able to find the lines of cleavage throughout the body. All right, so that is our lecture on the integumentary system. Thank you all for listening. I'll see you on the next lecture.